in Central California, one prison is on the brink of war. This is a house full of gasoline at any point. It can ignite. Two gangs, the whites and southern Mexicans, are squaring off, making weapons, melted down, plotting assaults, and viciously attacking each other. The officers struggle to keep them under control. Open cell 217! Open cell 217! But this prison is dangerously overcrowded. 120 violent criminals live in one room without a single cell wall to separate them. Oh, man, this place is messed up, man. In the brewing race war, this could be ground zero. Welcome to Salinas Valley State Prison. In one of California's most dangerous prisons, on one of the state's most violent yards, an inmate has just been stabbed. He is white. His two attackers are Hispanic. They waited for the perfect moment to strike. Few officers were around, so the Hispanics could do the most damage. The white inmate has wounds on his chest, back, and hands. The pepper spray used to stop his attackers burns their eyes and skin. But they'll endure anything for their gang, the Southern Mexicans. Officers estimate 70% of criminals who enter Salinas were in gangs outside prison. Inside, they take it a step further, merging with gangs of similar ethnic backgrounds and forming massive racial armies. The gangs are notorious for their violence. Officers combat nearly 200 attacks each year. Today's stabbing took place on Sea Yard, the gang's main battleground. It's under the command of Lieutenant Joseph Celaya. This is a very violent yard. I think at one time, I think we were in the most violent yard in the state of California. There are four yards at Salinas, labeled A, B, C, and D. But C is the most violent. The surrounding housing units hold a volatile mix of level three and four inmates, the two highest security rankings. This dangerous combination gives gangs the manpower they need to wage war. From level four generals who call shots from the cell blocks to level three foot soldiers who carry out orders. Now, all the generals and soldiers are on the ground. Officers ordered them to get down seconds after the stabbing. Violence is an everyday occurrence here, but today's attack is different. Look at the camera. The southern Mexican inmates struck across color lines and stabbed a white man. It alarms all the officers. In most cases, if a violent act occurs, it's usually within the same race or the same gang sect. But since this actually crossed over gang ties and racial ties, that puts us more uneasy because now it involves whole populations. The stabbing is the latest sign that Southern Mexicans and whites are on the verge of war. Staff discovered six weapons on inmates in the past week. Officers suspect they're arming themselves for a bigger battle. All the Southern Mexicans now, are they gonna assault the other white inmates? We don't know that. Are the whites gonna retaliate uh, on all Southern Mexicans? We don't know that. We don't know if it's going to be ongoing. We don't know if it's going to be isolated. Officers form a human barrier between the different gangs. The inmates segregate into five ethnic groups. The Southern Mexicans, the Northern Mexicans, the whites, the blacks, and the others, which includes Asians and Native Americans. Unit. 
Officers allow the blacks, northern Hispanics, and others to leave the yard without being searched. But staff take every precaution with the two gangs they're most worried about, the whites and southern Mexicans. Officers search each of these inmates for weapons by hand. All right, back up. Chilly, 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 chilly. Stay still. Prisoners hide knives called shanks, in the ground, in their clothes, or in their bodies. Can you please the other way, please? Officers handcuff all 130 inmates, then physically escort each one to his housing unit. The most dangerous inmates, classified as level four, live in C cell block. The criminals behind these doors include the gang leaders, called generals, who order assaults, riots, even murders. One of the southern Mexican generals ordered today's stabbing. Officer Richard Reynoso wants to know who. If he can figure out which major players are involved in the brewing war, he may be able to stop the next battle. The key to everyone's safety will be keeping the whites and southern Mexicans under control. The biggest fear would be uh, assaults on staff. Keeping control of the yard is, uh, is number one thing. But there is another place in this prison far more likely to spiral out of control. See Jim. It's been converted into a makeshift dorm. Salinas is severely overcrowded, packed with 500 more inmates than it was meant to hold. 120 of them live in the gym, stacked three high with no cell walls to separate them. The crowded conditions increase tension between the groups, and their numbers are far from equal. The southern Mexicans dominate with 63 inmates. There are 20 northern Hispanics, 13 blacks, 14 others, and only nine whites. The only thing that separates them are the gang and racial lines they draw. It's all, it's all really race. Everything is about race. We try to make sure, you know, we stay together. Anything can happen at any given time. These inmates join gangs for protection. There is safety in numbers. They become the gang foot soldiers, doing whatever the generals command. But unlike their generals, the soldiers have short sentences, a few months or years. Any gang violence they commit will extend their time behind bars. This is the jungle. It's got insane rules, and you're going to have to live by them. Travis Evanoff and John Berry survived the last six months in Sea Gym by sticking with the whites. Both have only a few years left. Berry's in for robbing a gas station at gunpoint. Evanoff for assault with a firearm. If they can avoid war with the southern Mexicans, they'll likely get out on time. But they must follow their gang's rules. Rule number one, be willing to fight and die for your gang. It's not only about preserving yourself, it's about preserving who you hang out with. Rule number two, respect every gang's territory. Your, your goal is, is just to navigate this place. You know, you don't, you don't walk through another man's bunk area, you don't walk through another man's day room, you don't, you don't get in another man's shower stall. Rule number three, never discuss gang business, what inmates call politics. Uh. 
So are, are there politics in here? In this um, that's something we can't talk about it because after you guys leave we have to live here and we live by a certain set of rules We can't discuss what's going on with other people's or any type of politics that would be in here We cannot do something we just cannot discuss Even if it could save their lives In the gym the southern Mexicans outnumber the whites by a ratio of seven to one this is it. What you see is what you get. This is this is our group. The, you know we're the whites occupy three bunks in the middle of the gym. The southern Mexicans surround them. The other three groups, the northern Hispanics, blacks, and others, are positioned on the opposite side of the gym. Most inmates must cross through southern Mexican territory to use the bathroom watch television, or go to the yard. The whites are trapped in a battlefield where they can't win. And Barry and Evanoff suspect their generals are plotting retaliation for the stabbing. This is a, it's a house full of gasoline at any point. It can ignite. On the other side of Salinas, a busload of new inmates is pulling in. Lopez. Renteria. Of the 10 men on board, all are level four, except one. Chris Brown is a level three, doing time for violating parole. This is his second stint in prison. The first was for grand theft. Okay, go ahead, strip out. Everything, full Monty. An officer orders Brown to strip to make sure he isn't hiding weapons on his body. Turn around, squat cough. <coughs> or inside it. If an inmate has a weapon in his rectal cavity, a common hiding place, he won't squat and cough because he'll be stabbed internally. Brown, who has just turned 21, thinks he can handle this prison. When I hit the yard, I know exactly what to do. I asked little questions here and there to see how this prison is ran. He talks tough about what he will do and what he won't. Can't nobody dictate who you talk to and who you hang around with. That's one thing they can't do. Uh, pretty much but he's a stranger here and doesn't know what lies ahead. Your, uh, shower shoes I'm gonna put right here. I said, I never heard about this, this prison exact, but I hope. I hope, I hope it's all right. Man, I just can't wait to get a sale and call it a day. But Brown isn't heading to a cell. His new home has 120 dangerous inmates, and it's hovering on the brink of war. Two officers lead the new inmate to C facility of California's Salinas Valley State Prison. Behind these walls, a race war between the Southern Mexicans and whites is reaching a breaking point. Chris Brown enters his dorm, a converted gym. What's happening, homie? Okay, cool, cool, cool. Brown's white jumpsuit broadcasts that he's new. Hey, I just came to visit, that's it, homie. He scans the sea of faces for one thing, other blacks. Hey, where, where, my, where, my, where my people at? <laughs> he knows that the safest place for him is with his own race. Straight this way. Brown makes his way to the back corner and is assigned bunk. What's happening, no? Let's go. He gets a mattress, one bag of personal belongings, and some sheets. But Brown didn't expect to be sleeping with 119 other criminals. Man, I thought I was gonna go to some sales, man. 
his world is now reduced to the bottom bunk. Man. As he gets settled, other black inmates gather around him. Vegas field. All right, strollers. With no bars to protect him, Brown knows his survival depends on these men. With each introduction, Brown identifies himself by his gang, the Crips. What's up, homie? Clown, I'm Crip, Stroller Boy Crip. Bakersfield. From Stroller Boy Crip, Bakersfield. What's happening, homie? Crip, Stroller Boy Crip. Bakersfield, okay. At his last prison, Brown stuck with fellow gang members. But at Salinas, most inmates band together by race, not outside gang affiliations. There's only a few, it's only like you make 13. A lot of people for the road, 13 blacks in here. The group of blacks who run with two different gangs on the streets would be rivals outside prison. What's up, friend? But with the race war escalating, their safety depends on sticking together. Brown is quickly brought into the circle. He gave you some pants already? No. Good. Um, where the pants at? Look, 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 look. Kent, where the pants at? His bunkmate, called a bunkie, loans him a regular uniform to help him blend in. Inmates all around him are prepared for battle. They explain that the escalating war has all the groups on edge. We don't get to go to commissary, you don't get nothing here. Man, we really, and when we go to the yard, we always yard down. We always gotta be on our stomachs. The blacks really don't be getting into, since I've been here, they ain't really been getting into shit. It's been like, it's the personal shit. You see blacks get into it, it's, 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 it's personal. It ain't been no stabbing yeah, between the blacks and shit, but the Southsiders and the white boys, it's always, you know, stabbing or some shit like that going down. But right now, they on lockdown. Yeah. You know, somebody just got stabbed like five days ago or something on the yard. So, so they on lockdown. Man, it's been like five of them, five, six of them last few weeks. It is more than Brown bargained for. He has one advantage. Most of the black inmates are assigned to the gym's back corner. They've made this their main hangout, hoping that staying on the sidelines will help them avoid trouble. Their survival strategy in the midst of the escalating war? Ignore violence between the whites and southern Mexicans. Not your own business in here. If you get in that shit, you know, what's going on, you know what I mean? Why are you guys fighting this? You know, we got a problem. To stay safe, the blacks avoid the most dominant group, the Southern Mexicans. This deadly gang has strict rules. Among them, no one talks on camera. It's like a secret society. A lot of people won't talk to you because the repercussions of them speaking to you will be bodily harm. But one person will reveal their secrets. The inmate who used to command them. Some call me Cholo. I don't go by that name anymore. For a year and a half, Oscar Cristales was a CER general. He's serving life for murder. I was kind of a CEO of CER, uh, being in charge of close to 250 people. I was on my way up. With each year behind bars, he rose in rank, fighting his way to the top with stabbings and assaults. But when Southern Mexican leaders told him to have his middle school teacher killed, Cristales refused. The Southern Mexicans now have a hit out on him. I was blinded, and it took me many years to see that. Now he lives in protective custody, away from the gang life he knows so well. Everybody was required to get up at a certain time, 5.30. You can't miss chow. In case something happened, you were there. CR was run as a military camp. When it was time for war, the orders came from his cell block. The generals would send messages into the gym in forms of kites or notes. Um, they would be hidden in many places. 
they would be taken in and they would have to be read by the person who is the voice for the gym. They have to have someone there that takes the order and he passes it on to everybody else. And his soldiers had to obey. If someone was to say no, they would get stabbed. Cristala suspects today's escalating war started because the whites broke southern Mexican rules. Every yard that it's run by southerners, the whites have to abide by our rules. These are the consequences of people not bowing down to southerners. We have the people, uh, we have the weapons. They're just trying to show them who's boss. That's all new for a fact, this ain't supposed to be here. Chris Brown doesn't know the Southern Mexicans rules yet, but he's become fast friends with convicted drug dealer, Philip Vaughn, nicknamed Louisiana. They crack jokes and goof off. What he say, why he take that Ferrari? Why he didn't take that Then, Louisiana offers to teach Brown how to avoid Southern Mexican territory. Every square foot is segregated. He's first, the first, the first desk, the first five. One, two, three, four, five. It's the only ones we mess with. Okay, we don't, we don't go the first five, the first five desks. You, you know what I'm saying? You, you only mess with these right here. The rest of them, you know what I'm saying, down in the remainder, is the South Siders and the whites. You know what I'm saying? Excuse me, see? You know what I'm saying? Damn. Brown could be stabbed for using the wrong toilet. Okay, this right here, this is, this is what I'm saying, the sinks, we, we, we get brush your teeth, wash your face, you know what I mean? If it's an emergency, you need to use a two, number two, that's what it's for. But we don't, we, we use number twos on all those right there, in that whole row. Pistols, the full stools, the emergency, it could be this one, you know what I'm saying? The sour area, you know what I'm saying? This, this, this is one of the ours right here. This one's right here. The other one up there is for the southern, it's for the southerners and whites, but this is ours right here. This one, if nobody's in line for that one, we can use that one. The most important rule, never walk through southern Mexican bunk areas. If Brown does, they'll suspect he's going to attack. We don't walk straight through the day room over here, man. It's just you cut off right here. When you come through from over here, cut through right here. We got to stay every. This is us right here, man. And there is one place that terrifies Louisiana. It's right here. Sea Yard. He refuses to go outside. That's a yard. That's all yard right there. That's yard we go to. I don't f with it though. That's all yard right there. That's the one yard. This is two yard right here. You know what I'm saying? You feel me? Nah, I'm, I'm good, man. The brewing war could spark widespread. violence on the yard, forcing Louisiana to fight. If he does, the prison will add three months to his sentence. Back at his bunk, Brown admits he's overwhelmed by living with 119 inmates all around him. I was counting on going to sales. Sales is cool. Ain't gotta, you know, mess with a di different folks. You know, just one person. But there is one thing Louisiana failed to tell him. Brown has to be careful within his own race as well. Like all gangs, the black inmates have a hierarchy, and Louisiana is near the bottom. Brown's bunkmate, Tico Mack, who goes by Holiday, is at the top, and he doesn't approve of Brown's new friend. Hey. He's your buddy now. He's gonna pretty much follow you anywhere you're stuck. I try to warn you. Um, <laughs> hey, 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 I'm going to tell you something like this, my guy. I know how to get rid of him because I'm already knowing who's solid and who, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I'm going to get at you, though, about that situation. You know? Huh? You know? Who? Dude. No. Uh, but I'm going to let you know, I you know. best friends. Uh-huh. I thought you were best friends. Oh, uh, no, we just chopping it. You know, I got to meet Holiday, folks, you know who's you serving know, seven so years for armed assault, lets I Brown know me? he has ways of getting rid of black inmates he doesn't like. You notice my other bunkie is gone, right? Huh? You guys notice he's missing. Uh -huh. He's in the hole now for nothing. Oh, man, this place is messed up, man. Already Brown finally realizes just how dangerous his new home is. This, this is it. That's all, I, that's all I got to look for until I get out. That's about it, man. 
Hopefully everything can go good. Hopefully. Outside C Gym, the yard is empty. The inmates are kept inside for three days. The whites and southern Mexicans are peaceful. So on the fourth day, the prison allows inmates back outside. But as they head out, an alarm shrieks. It's coming from C facility. All the way down. California's Salinas Valley State Prison is under a Code 2 emergency, their second highest state of alert. Officers rush to C Block, but when they get there, it's over. Two whites jump two southern Mexicans on the walkway outside their cells. They struck as soon as the cell doors opened as the inmates walked to Sea Yard. It was the whites' best chance to retaliate for last week's stabbing. The white generals are sending a clear message. They will fight at any opportunity. It means Salinas Valley State Prison has a race war on its hands. The officers now know that recent violence between the two races was all interconnected. The past few weeks, we've had some uh, major issues going on with, between these two races in the prison system. The whites and the Southern Mexicans, they've been having, they've been assaulting each other, and this is what led up to today. To stop the attacks, officers put C facility on lockdown. Inmates are confined to their cells and bunks 22 hours a day. But the isolation won't stop two warring gangs. In fact, gangs often instigate lockdown on purpose to plot their next move. We go on lockdown whenever we want. We have control of everything that happens in the prison, except the gates. Restricted to their cells, the whites and southern Mexicans have time to make weapons, turning everyday items into knives and shanks and they'll find ways to communicate their battle plans. If everybody's on lockdown, they will pay people. They pay them off with dope, you know, money, to get a message to wherever they need to get to. All the foot soldiers can do is wait for orders. Prison is just, it's, it's two things. It's boring and it's terrifying. Boring because nothing ever happens and terrifying because anything can happen. The war makes new inmate Chris Brown nervous. He's struggling to adjust, something he'll only discuss out of earshot from the other inmates. When I walked into the gym for the first time, I thought it was going to be pretty cool, you know what I mean? You know, so I thought it was going to be lovely. And that, that was, Man, everything changed from there. Lockdown traps Brown in his bunk area. He leaves only for three meals and one shower a day. This week been hard, man. All you do is sleep, read. It ain't, it ain't really been good. Brown won't go into specifics about the war. If he's learned one thing, it's that discussing gang politics is strictly off limits. What goes on the yard stays on the yard, you know what I mean? And uh, that's how it is here, that's how it is in prison. His revelations came at a high price. In his short time here, he's already made a terrible mistake. I did a little something I shouldn't have did already, you know what I mean? Walked in a different, in the in South Siders area on accident, you know, and uh, my people talked to me about that. Black inmates had to apologize to the Southern Mexicans for the black group, which is trying to lay low, it was unwanted attention. He won't make that mistake again, you know what I mean? He's a grown man. He's not going to keep just deliberately up. Let's go. If Brown messes up again, his own race could turn on him. Just a few days ago, 
they suddenly forced out one of their own. Louisiana is gone. The other black inmates scared him so much, he asked to be put in protective custody, the ultimate shame in other inmates' eyes. He refuses to come out of his cell, and Holiday won't say exactly what happened. Louisiana had several passes and several opportunities to be a man. He couldn't step up to the plate, so he had to go, plain and simple. Holiday wants his fellow blacks to take their surroundings seriously. You got anything to say on that, man? I got Especially I in the midst of a war. It's not really funny in here. We might, we might crack a joke and everyone laughs, but as far as walking around giggling like an idiot, you can't do that, man. You see, something's going to happen to you. Some, I'm going to stop, right yeah, stop right there. Yeah, I'm going to stop right there. Get that head crack wide open. Brown says he's ready to fight. We got to stick together. That's what we got to do. If, it, if it's three of us, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen. But we soldiers, man, we're going to go out right. You know what I mean? But the soldiers of C. Jim are up against another powerful group, the prison's gang investigation unit. Okay, so you know who's who. Officer Reynoso gave them a lead that may help stop this war from escalating. All right, guys. He's learned high-ranking gang members in two cells may be making weapons for the warring gangs. One cell is white. Uh, the first target's gonna be uh, inmate Smith. The uh, other Smith. is Southern Mexican. The team gathers to prepare for a raid. Well, then let's get ready to move. The inmates could become violent, using weapons against the officers, but it's the best chance the team has to stop the next battle. They'll go in at 0500 hours. Before sunrise, the gang investigation team gathers outside C facility of California's Salinas Valley State Prison. They need to catch the white and southern Mexican inmates by surprise before they dispose of weapons or drugs. They sneak into the southern Mexican cell block. But the inmates hear them coming. He's flushing, he's flushing. Crack, go, crack. go! Down! Officers cut the water supply and blast in pepper spray. Within seconds, the inmates relent. Open cell 217. Open cell 217. Stay right here. I'm going to do one at a time. Okay. You search the other tier. Officer Lisa Zoracek investigates the toilet where the inmates were trying to ditch contraband. The item could be written gang orders, a weapon, or drugs. There's only one way to find out. What appears to be something wrapped with either white string or white paper, so not exactly sure what it is. It feels hard like it would like it's metal. Oh yeah, sure enough. It's a weapon wrapped in paper. The inmates sharpened it on the cell wall, evident from scratch marks could do some serious bodily damage, can even kill somebody. And that's not all she finds. You can tell that they got started on trying to dig. The southern Mexicans carved out the wall to make a hiding place for weapons or drugs. But the officers stopped them before they could fill it in with a paste made of soap. The white gang cell is next. Do it now. Do it now. The team catches inmate Wayne Smith and his cellmate completely off guard. They have no choice but to follow orders. Gang unit officers Stacy Henley and Paul Rivera turn the cell inside out. They discover a shank hidden in a sock. Henley suspects it's made of a coffee cup handle. I think that's actually the one of the state issued cups. The and handle. it's the handle. There's a blue one. And it would be this portion right here. And what they do is they take a pair of boxer shorts and they pull the elastic out and they'll cut right through it. And then they take this, heat it, melt it straight or as straight as they can get it, and then they'll attach the metal and they'll her theory is dead on. 
she finds the cup used to make the weapon. So this is the cup that we believe that they used to make that weapon out of. And as you can see, what they do is they cut off the end, straighten it, and then place their metal stock on there. See what kind of letter it is. Then the officers find something big, a ripped up inmate letter known as a kite. This is how the inmates communicate from one pod to another. They'll give it to someone to, to run from pod to pod or building to building. He said he had to take care of some debts, so he's only got one pack now. The kite may order the white gang to carry out a hit against the southern Mexicans. Officer Henley immediately pieces it together. The information on here can be anywhere from narcotics to planned assaults. Henley discovers the kite was sent from an inmate to the target of the cell search, Wayne Smith. I'm in a dilemma and I could really use that tool because I already promised them to Kenny. The writer promises Smith drugs in exchange for a weapon. It means more whites may be armed. And Smith, an influential white gang member, isn't about to say who. I have nothing to say about that one. Smith is serving 200 years for eight counts of armed robbery. He's being held for questioning in a three by three foot metal cage. Smith's been in C facility for nearly a year and on lockdown for all but two weeks. The idle time has put him on edge. It goes on for six months, eight months, a year, and then going into 18 months, it's, you know, it's, it's hard not to have tension in there all the time. The foot soldiers heard about the cell raids and no weapons could already be in the gym. They're trapped, restricted to their five by six foot bunk areas. As you can see, we're on bunk status. We're confined to this coffin-like space. The idle hands are no good in this place. You, know, you get idle hands, you start thinking about stuff. And if you start thinking, your mind drives you crazy. John Berry and Travis Evanoff worry the next battle in the war will involve them. Well, everybody in this gym has a date, a few months to the house, maybe a year or two, where the people on the yard are lifers. They're never going home, and this is their world. This isn't our world, we're just visitors. If they fight for the whites, their sentences may be extended. If they don't, fellow whites could assault or stab them. Just have to actually pray and hope that nothing's gonna happen in between now and then, and it's gonna keep us in this up prison. Okay, today's briefing is going to be on the search of C. Jim. And Lieutenant Joseph Salaya and his officers know the gym is one step away from exploding. If the inmates have weapons, the officers have to find them fast. Salaya's plan, search every square inch of the gym. But the inmates will outnumber the officers by a ratio of six to one. Uh, just be aware, those guys are not in cells. They're walking around. So be extremely careful. We're going to put them onto the yard, give them gun coverage, and then we'll go in in mass and search that gym and clear it. Richard Renoso and 20 officers enter the gym at 0600 hours. It's a rude awakening. Nearly all the inmates, including Chris Brown, are still sleeping. And they woke us out of some good ass sleep. That's what they did do. Outside, officers order the inmates to strip. They inspect each item of clothing, focusing on the waistbands, a common place for inmates to sew shanks. Then, officers wave a metal detector over their stomachs and lower backs to see if they've inserted weapons into their rectal cavities. <laughs> Staff clear all 120 inmates and line them up. They'll be here for the next two hours. We've had numerous stabbing assaults. 
cell fights. We have people request for protective custody. And when they protected custody, they gave up information where weapons were stored. So that's part of the reason why we did searches of the gym. The officers hit pay dirt. They discover three shanks made of a toothbrush, a coffee mug, and broken bunk parts. Any of them could kill an inmate or an officer. It appears Brown's initiation is complete. He now understands Salinas Valley State Prison and their strategy to survive. But tonight, all the inmates may be sucked into the race war because the battle is about to begin. As night falls at California's Salinas Valley State Prison, the gym is seemingly normal, with inmates reading, listening to music, and watching television. But that ends as soon as our cameras leave. At exactly eight o'clock, as four whites gather for the season premiere of their favorite show, Prison Break, 20 Southern Mexicans emerge from the bunk areas and attack. Other white inmates see the riot and rush to help. But they manage only a few punches before they're knocked unconscious. The Southern Mexicans are armed with crude shanks and batteries they swing in socks. Now, the whites' bunks are stripped bare. For their own safety, they're in administrative segregation, known as the hole. This is Salinas Valley's most secure unit, where inmates are locked in their cells 23 hours a day. The whites wear handcuffs wherever they go and are only allowed to talk to us from inside metal cages. John Berry remembers only bits and pieces of the riot. I heard fish cracking. I looked over and saw that it was, it was a racial riot between us and the Southsiders. And so I ran over there and got involved to try to help out them because there was so many of them, there was so little of us. I had to try to help out as much as I could. All nine white inmates were badly beaten. I got a black eye, um, some knots on my head, and I was stabbed twice in my back. My ribs prevented it from going to my lung. I got hit in the head with something. I don't remember what it was. And I, I remember going down. Uh, that's pretty much all I remember until I woke up in the hospital. Yeah, I received uh, a couple puncture marks on my back. The riot scared Travis Evanoff so much, he'll no longer appear on camera. Officers suspect Southern Mexican generals gave the order to strike through a kite. They believe a cafeteria worker passed it to the Sea Gym soldiers just a few hours before the riot. It only lasted about two minutes, but two minutes can seem like forever when you get hit. Though violent, the riot was brief. Officers think the Southern Mexicans planned it that way. They attacked near the main door, knowing staff could respond quickly before more Southern Mexicans had to get involved. The Southern Mexicans lost only a third of their gang to the whole, maintaining their majority and ousting the whites. I'm not thinking that any one of us was a target. I think it was just just get rid of the white guys, pretty much. Barry says the whites had to defend themselves. I don't deal with stuff unless it's absolutely I have to. I've been down six years and this is my first violence. He lost the thing he values most, his release date. The prison added three months to Barry's sentence. Both he and Evanoff will likely be transferred to other prisons. It's too dangerous to keep them at Salinas. Wherever they end up, they may have to fight again. Best way to describe it would be there's different countries. Sometimes we're the big country, sometimes we're the small country. And every country goes to war. In the gym, the black gang's strategy of laying low 
paid off. They managed to stay safely on the sidelines. We're over here, um, pretty much spectators of the whole event. The white guys are gone now. It's probably for their best, for their safety right now, man. They can't be in here, dude. Why that going on? It's not going to stop. So either get them out of here or send, send notices to their families, you know what I mean? Because they're going to get buried, man. For Chris Brown, the riot was another eye-opening experience about just where he lives and whom he lives with. For now, he knows how to navigate this minefield. I only got four months left. I can, I can make it out of here. I can go home. The riot proves to officers this war is just beginning. The gang generals are now willing to call up entire armies. In this overcrowded tinderbox, a spark has flared into a flame. All staff can do now is attempt to control the violence. They'll keep searching. We're, we'll never stop searching. We search every day. We'll never stop searching. The generals will keep plotting. Well, how big it is, I don't know, but it is brewing. The whites are not going to uh, stand down, and Southerners are going to keep doing it. So it's just, it's just the beginning. And the soldiers will keep fighting. Just like in a war, there's a general commanding troops. That's the way it works. Because the violence will never end in the war zone that is Salinas Valley State Prison.